Good morning to our data analytic group, or fellows, I should say, or biostatisticians, epidemiologists, and just great old guests to our small, small channel, a reference to basically the COVID-19 pandemic mitigation protocols. While we re will be reviewing tonight, we'll interject either published or bias or confirmation bias. Primary reason being is we're attempting to see if the pandemic mitigation uh, strategies being used as a whole are truly basically the right path. And the chart that we're looking at right here, I should say the graph, which we pulled from, let me show you real fast, from the VAERS Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, uh, this file right here. And for those who were here last week, this file has grown substantially in just seven days, meaning in layman's terms, there have been a heck of a lot of reports in the past seven days, about 40,000 new vaccine adverse event reports submitted to the system. All right, now, before I begin, let's look at this data work right here. This is the vaccine reaction reports by vaccine running from January 1st, 2021 to May 14th, 2021. These are all the vaccines which are normally administered as you see before you. And these are the adverse events reported uh, on all the vaccines, but particularly if you notice, there's only th maybe four, three that you see, and these are all the COVID vaccines. So by far, now this could be, you know, selection bias, confirmation bias, uh, you know, there could be, you know, there could be an individual uh, hysteria in reference to the vaccine itself. But however, though, I don't generally see that for those which are first in line for the vaccines. In fact, I usually see it the other way around. And keep in mind, too, the vaccine reaction reports of VAERS, on average, statistically or historically, only 1% of the reactions ever get reported. And we're going to review that in a second. So what we'll do is we'll come back to this, but let's go right into the data as follows, because this data is real important. Not a lot out there this time in reference to being helpful into pandemic mitigation, more questioning the strategy, especially the vaccine strategy at hand. So the first thing we'll look at is this one here. This was published October 20, uh, sorry, October, October 22nd, 2020. Please forgive me for those not familiar. Again, I do this in one run and no retakes. So here we are. This toxic, this, uh, basically report that we see your vaccine natural infection induced mechanisms that could modulate vaccine safety it was an important report that came out in October. What it does, it's going to explain to you or basically elaborate on reference to the shortcuts that were utilized in reference to the reference, reference the reference, uh, the current vaccines being manufactured. For example, I think that like on the, R, the mRNA, before now, there were only like 840 individuals incorporated in any trials reference to those uh, microRNA vaccines. Um, and that was it. And there was usually the outcome was reference to cancer trials. So let us proceed with that data as follows. Let's go into this and we're going to take some excerpts. Again, due to the fact the limited time, in all fairness, we are going to be interjecting some publisher bias, but only in the information that we select. All right, we're not going to make conclusions based upon that information. So I want to try to avoid publisher bias as much as possible, meaning I'm picking and choosing the information. So here we go, proceed as follows. Here we are. From the data from the, the same study, this is the PDF format. And if I can get to the top here, all right, this is what we're looking at. So this is the study itself. And as we go down the study, bum, bum, bum. Page down, page down. Wonderful study to refer to reference. And I'll have all the links on the YouTube channel as well. Oops, and of course, again, we're gonna run through one time. There, stay there. All right, here we go. Traditional vaccine protocols in reference to vaccine development. This is why they were so difficult and not very profitable for a lot of companies. All right, recognize here, we're looking at basically years. See right there? All the way down the line? Oh, great. Stop that. Again, no, only one run. So here you are. Phase one normally takes about a year and a half uh, in dose selection and safety. Phase two, two to three years. Phase three, three to four years. Five, licensure, large scale manufacturing distribution, 12 to 15 years. With the COVID vaccine, uh, 
due to the uh, the how to decide describe it as the urgency, the sense of urgency, not knowing which direction it was going to head, they basically took a lot of shortcuts. And the shortcuts they took were basically not looking at the following information that you see here. I'm not going to read, well, I will read part of it, antibody-dependent enhancement, immune enhancement, cross-reactivity, nonspecific vaccine, antigenic, bystander activation, immune invasion. This one right here uh, is pretty important to me. Actually, sorry, chronic immune activation. That's the one that kind of uh, I have my greatest concern personally. Uh, but let's look right here. So you basically you had a vaccine brought to market within an incredibly short time, cutting out really virtually no phase two and phase three trials. That's why a lot of researchers are looking at post-marketing surveillance to try to rationalize the efficacy of the vaccine because a lot of the safety protocols in place were not really uh, produced in a method that was traditional, i.e. traditional vaccine. So let's proceed as follows down the line. And we're going to look right here. Let's see, just one dip. I just want to make sure I'm going to the right page there, 1450. And I'll have all the links on the YouTube channel to repeat as well. And what we have here is a couple different things. All right. These are possibly some of the outcomes they have to watch out for, long-term outcomes. One virus may enhance infection with a different virus. That's a highlight. Gut microbiota. Uh, interesting reference to the R M mRNA vaccines itself. Uh, it can actually alter gut microbiota. It was actually researched quite, uh, quite readily in reference to that. Uh, if you look at a lot of the uh, biowarfare stuff. Uh, not in reference to this, but however, though, potentially at one time you would come across some studies uh, on PLOS or the NCBI, uh, where they looked at mRNA uh, in reference to defense protocols. Uh, then you look right here, chronic immune activation. All right, so, but I can't, obviously I have more time, I'd love to, but these are all the potential negative outcomes that were not looked into in reference to the vaccines being developed. All right, now again, it comes down to a sense of urgency. Now, as time went on, you know, things may not have appeared as urgent, but still just the same. Now, here's another aspect too. Remember I said on the VAERS or the vaccine adverse uh, events reported, fewer than 1% of vaccine adverse events are reported. So when we look at data like this, and if you think that 1%, all right, so let's see if I have a, a good idea of the length of the data frames here. Yeah, so if you look at the length of the data frames per se, I think it's something like 200 and, yeah, 217,716. All right, so that's the length of the data frame, and I'll go more into that in a few seconds. So if you look at 217,716 reports, and then you basically uh, dwell on only that could be only just one percent of all the reports uh, adverse events being reported it gives food for thought so to, to read forward and fewer than one percent of vaccine events adverse adverse please forgive me again it's a little late adverse events are reported how well does the sample reflect the total of adverse events actually experienced it's not a randomly selected sample as one be required statistically valid results thus even analysis of short-term adverse events based on various data are severely flawed. If fewer than 1% of these short-term adverse events are reported, what fraction of long-term adverse events where the connection between the adverse event and the vaccination, be the vaccination becomes more tenuous as time proceeds would be reported? One can only conclude that a negligible fraction of long-term adverse events reported in a passive monitoring system like Vera's. All right, next highlight. Thus, the following examples reflect the extremely small tip of an extremely large iceberg of long-term adverse vaccine events. To caveat this, this is not to uh, create alarm, install fear. This is, this is generally for conjecture, analysis, and again, risk to benefit ratio. Does the risk of the vaccine justify, or the benefit of the vaccine, I should say, justify the risk. Again, that is for you to decide, not for me to decide for you. But however, though, for example, to give a few examples here of the other vaccines where they found out in animal studies that certain things they may have not been um, conducive. And 
you know, once a, a vaccine is on the market, there's very little post, I mean, for a certain per, certain time, there are very few post-marketing surveillances of that vaccine. So evaluation can take some quite some time. But here is a list of potential uh, that they're concerned with. I'm not going to read through the entire list. Uh, this will be in 4K. And so hopefully you can enlarge. Remember, even though the video is produced in 4K, it takes a few days for it to be actually that clear. It starts coming clear within about 24 hours, but still be patient and it'll be, all, it'll be crystal clear on the video, especially on YouTube. To proceed forward or down the line. Again, this is a very, very long article. All right, next one here. This is the concern of objectivity. And the main thing about science, obviously, is the fact is, for example, you'll hear me utilize the word bias. And bias means it can be subconscious, it can be conscious. It means I can be wrong, but based upon my perception, I'm right uh, due to personal experiences, positive or negative, that can cause me to color the outcome. This is the bias that these researchers are concerned about. It, or basically, and sometimes they even concern more about corruption. It is an interest in, remember uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, when the British Medical Journal just printed an entire expose on the corruption of the World Health Organization, as well as in Britain, uh, they will not release conflicts of interest financially in reference to vaccine development, but to proceed as follows. It is an interest of the federal government that approved vaccines have a high vaccine effectiveness. And a reading of the VE literature for the VE section contained in this paper shows clearly the emphasis by the sponsored research community, at least in the high impact factor journals, to emphasize high VE, meaning there is a you know rah 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 effect in reference to oh vaccine 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 it's great, you know a vaccine is a medicine. Bottom line, and not all medicines are good, and not all the vaccines are how I should say don't have the desired. Uh, positive effect. For the COVID-19 vaccines and development and the COVID-19 emergency measures being taken by the federal, state, and local governments, dissenting voices have to make themselves heard through venues other than peer-reviewed publications and mainline journals. That's really irritating to me because this is one thing this pandemic has done. I've never seen so much scientific analysis be basically pushed aside a reference to basically, I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican, a party line, period. And where a lot of researchers are even afraid to speak out, you'll always hear the same thing. If they have something negative to say, they always say, for example, if it's on regard to vaccines, they'll always say vaccines saved millions of lives through history, da 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 And then you read three paragraphs down after they basically show their loyalty to um, thought or groupthink, then they go into the actual data. And we're going to go into that in a second, too, in some of the research that comes out. This is a perversion of the scientific process. You, you, this is scientists speaking. These aren't journalists. This is a perversion of scientific approach requires that all knowledgeable voices be heard and results in published literature of questionable credibility. So, again, uh, it's something to think about in reference to when you have researchers crying out to be heard, uh, which actually, as you saw at the top, quite a few of them, uh, spent some time in the concern about the production of these vaccines and not being negative about it, just saying these are the issues that have to be looked after uh, in reference to these new vaccines that have to be monitored for the benefit of all. And to conclude down, the optimistic outlook for early vaccine dissemination to the public contradicts vaccine development history especially for coronavirus vaccines. Vaccine development, including limited safety testing, has taken an average of 12 to 15 years. Now, this is an interesting aspect. You ready? Vaccines for the coronavirus most closely associated with the SARS pandemic outbreak in 2002 and the MERS pandemic outbreak of 2012 have yet to be developed successfully, even after one to two decades of research. All right. Now, Obviously, we have the new vaccines, which were rushed to production with the noble sense of urgency. But however, though, so many safety protocols were removed that you really begin to wonder. And um, again, risk to benefit ratio. Did, does the benefit outweigh the potential risk in long-term health 
concerns. Um, if you were not being pressured by businesses or governments or friends to travel, because you know, it's obviously they're trying to incorporate, if you don't have a freedom, if they're trying to basically f scare you into a certain behavior, then your reality, your government or business or whatever it is, or your airline is partaking in what's called, you hear it often go, we have to give incentives to not wear a mask. It's called Stockholm Syndrome. And if you know what Stockholm Syndrome is, I really recommend that you look it up. But however, though, again, that is, I, this, as far as I'm concerned, that's Stockholm Syndrome. Publisher bias. That's publisher bias, all right? So keep in mind, that's not the, that's not, not the venue or the opinion of the researchers in re reference to this article. But however, though, they do bring up a real strong point. You're looking right there. Um, ba -bom. That's all the steps that will be skipped. And if you trust the vaccine, if you have trust the people producing the vaccine, and you trust your uh, bureaucratic officials, or you trust your airlines or your employer, which is going to force an individual to get a vaccine, or I should say force, the word primarily is coerced, um, then, then I'll be it. But these are the steps that were missed or skipped, missed or skipped. Uh, and these are the potential outcomes, uh, which would be negative. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. Keep in mind. But no one's checking right now. All right, next research as follows. Here we go. Bum, bum, bum. And again, all links will be there. You don't have to believe anything I say. It's not about believing. It's just about looking at data. And again, it's a little selection bias going on here, but it's still, you know, research is research. Uh, scientists find new way of predicting vaccine efficacy. All right, you're going to read this, this study. Uh, what it's really going uh, to come down to is this, without going into a lot of the detail and for the, uh, for the sake of time. You, it'll, um, you'll have some immune response up to 250 days. So the vaccines, and keep in mind too, the vaccines that were developed were developed on a strain of coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, which is rare today, except in some areas of Africa. They weren't even developed in reference to new strains. That's why you always hear them say on the news, oh, well, it may be effective against this new strain, a new strain, or this or that or this. It's, it, but, but there's no studies on it. So it's, it's always, that's what I mean by post-marketing surveillance. It's observational data, not lab data, where they're trying to postulate that, hey, well, we made the vaccine for this, but that doesn't exist anymore, but maybe it works for this. They may be right, they may be wrong, again. Uh, it's someone could tell me the moon is made of cheese and there's no way that I am going to be able to like well, probably some, some crazy math. You basically looking at the sun rotation shadows and so on and so forth. But honestly, unless I actually go to the moon myself, they could tell me it's made of cheese and, and how am I going to question it? It's either you decide to believe out of comfort or you don't, but to proceed as follows, 250 days, then a booster will probably be required. Incidents of SARS-CoV-2. This is a really good, uh, uh, interesting uh, article. Now, what they're doing is they're going rah, rah, rah into the benefits of the vaccine. And they're saying, well, the vac basically the, uh, the people vaccinated are benefiting the unvaccinated, which may be true, all right? But I wanna read you the actual numbers. And from there, I want you to make your own conclusion, not me. Again, I, it's, it's, uh, this is not about me. So this is just about you and I and others reviewing the data, which obviously is not surfaced uh, in a lot of the media sources. So here we are. What they did is they looked at 280 nursing homes in 20 and, and 21 states, as below. And so the residents who have been infected in 90 days, da, 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 it goes into all the vaccines, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, there's been a little individual data, da 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 da. Well, regardless of that, it's it's going to basically come to the conclusion. Thank you for the vaccines because now the unvaccinated are not going to be affected as well. But however, though, let's get right into the data as follows. Here we go. Here we go. Do 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 do. Again, I'm recorded, so please forgive the sound effects. All right, so let's look what we're looking at first. Let's go to the top. Do 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 do. All right, and get this highlighter off. Da da. There we go. So we have no. Uh, Highlighter malfunctions. 
you know, over highlighting. This is a supplementary index. All right, so here we are. This is the data, the raw data. This is what's so fun to look at because, again, this is this is where you get the information. There used to be an old term, again, the, during the Dark Ages called circumlocutions. And circumlocutions were basically where a lot of your, basically your Galileos and the Vinci's had to get information out there, but it was all in code. So a lot of books you would read would sound superfluous in their detail. But in reality, when you're reading things like Alice in Wonderland and things like that, it's alchemical texts and so on and so forth. It sounds fantastical. Uh, even, you know, a, a lot of manuscripts. But however, though, they were not meant to be taken verbatim. They're written in code. So let's get into our data. Do, 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 do. Here we are. All right, so here, look at it. This is unvaccinated. You see days after the clinic because they go to the vaccine clinic and they get tested regardless of that. So wonderful life for them. All right, so here we're looking at is nursing home vaccinations. All right, here we are. Residents with at least one dose of vaccine. And this is for low incidence counties, 250 cases per 10,000 population. So 15, 28 days, which past 14 days, 1.2% affected. Ah, get over there. All right, and we go to the same time, unvaccinated. The, the We'll just say basically the, uh, the rough and tough ones for whatever reason, don't want it. All right, here it goes. 0.7%. So here we see how to read the data down the column. All right, so then we go basically to those after the second dose. Now keep in mind, 28 plus 14 equals, you know, 42. All right, so that's what we're looking at. That's why you see the 42 there. So this is their second dose, 0.2%. Unvaccinated residents, 0.2%. Now, albeit, oh, look at this. I didn't really pay attention to that. Now, look at this. This is interesting. You remember, the vaccine was designed supposedly to reduce the severity of infection, all right? Not necessarily transmission. Of the low vaccine population, or the double vaccine by that time, 50% are asymptomatic. Of the unvaccinated hardcore iron core individuals, which, you know, don't want anything new, 66.7% are asymptomatic. All right, so it's a higher number. That means 66.7% of the people would not know they had anything unless they were told they had something compared to 50%. Moderate, all right. There's some wins in there, a lot losses, so to say, uh, depending on which side you're on. Um, after the second vaccine, 0.3%. 0.4%, see? A little bit of a, not there, a little bit difference there. Not enough to me, for example, say that's a strong enough power rating if you sit under statistics to say, hey, that's a rational that you can say, hey, wow, the vaccine works. Look at this. 78.6% asymptomatic, 85.7%. All right. Understanding that the higher the percentage of asymptomatic, the less, it just means that people are, had to, they had to be told that they were sick. Otherwise, we would not know that they were sick. Higher incidence, a highly infectious area. <laughs> this is amazing. Ready for this? Uh, all right, 14 days, 92.9% are asymptomatic, all right, and keep in mind, well, look at this, I didn't pay attention to this, look right here, here it is, right there, 0.4% of those with both vaccines become infected, all right, 0.2% of the unvaccinated, right off the bat, let's, re let's, let's reference or review vaccine efficacy or vaccine effectiveness. There's obviously some sort of breach. Doesn't mean the vaccine is not effective in some aspects, uh, but but if I'm looking at the data here, and let's say some sort of confounding, which I'm not aware of, uh, yeah, it doesn't. It looks like the unvaccinated. I mean, you could say the unvaccinated are benefiting from those that are getting vaccinated. But however, though, the unvaccinated seem to be doing better than the unvaccinated uh, than the vaccinated. And I would not suspect that. I would not expect that the vaccinated are because, because the unvaccinated become 100% asymptomatic. So that means everyone that in this group, for example, from here on down, they would not know they were sick unless someone told them they were sick. Case one. Case two. Let's go to the next one. Da, 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 All right, here it is. Staff vaccinations. All right. 15, 28 days, 14 days. Remember, 28 plus 14 equals 42. Here we are. Low staff vaccination. 0.4%. 0.4%. 0.4%. 0.4%. 0.4%. 0.4%. 
0.4%. The 0.4% here are asymptomatic. The 72% here are asymptomatic. So again, you see the numbers, you make your own judgment call. Moderate staff vaccination, so basically, you know, obviously a good proportion of the staff is vaccinated. And keep in mind, these are nursing home residents. These are the primary individuals, the most vulnerable. These are the people that the vaccine was designed to help. All right, so keep in mind. Point two, point two. 75, 66. All right, so you had one person here, for example, that may have uh, you know, felt something compared to the asymptomatic group here. So let's give them that, all right? In reference to the vaccine crowd. So in this one, I wouldn't say beyond any statistical significance, but they had a better day in the vaccine crowd there. Now I'll go high staff vaccination, all right? I like how they broke, the New England Journal of Medicine broke this down too. So again, the researchers, you know, they may have uh, written their article a little differently, but still I have to have gratitude for the researchers because this is actually research that people can use to gauge vaccine efficacy. All right, here we go. And thank goodness they did it. High set vaccinations. Do, 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 0.3, 0 0.3, right? <laughs> again, generally, right, not statistically insignificant, but however, though, again, the three, obviously, out of this group that uh, obviously were, had coronavirus, did not know they had it unless they were told. So it's really weird as a general rule because the group's a little smaller. I would like to see the group, I would like to see the groups the same size that that when they are infected, the fact the uh, the infections are generally milder than the individuals which are vaccinated. And the vaccine was developed once again for reduce the severity of the reactions. It may have been very, very, very effective against the initial strain that it was produced and tested against, but times have changed. So let's proceed down. And what is the other one? Uh, more graphs and charts. Well, let's move on to that. Again, links will be there for you to follow. It is not about trusting me. Don't trust me. Always have information that can validate uh, your hypothesis or at least observation. All right, let's see. So let's go to the next one. Ba -ba -bam. And this was the article. And it's a really good article. Um, see, and right, and see how it, the interpretation. And these are wonderful, wonderful researchers. But it's, it's you know, I look at the, the information different than they look at it. That's all it means. These findings show the real world effectiveness of the mRNA vaccines in reducing the incidence of asymptomatic and symptomatic SARS CoV 2 infections in their vulnerable nursing home population. Observation of reduced incidence of infection among unvaccinated residents suggests that robust vaccine coverage among residents and staff, together with continued use of face mask control measures, is likely to afford, uh, afford protection for small numbers of unvaccinated residents in congregated settings. Still a continued observation of incident of cases of vaccination highlights the critical need for ongoing vaccination programs. Dark ages, circumlocutions. So if you read the article and you're a reporter or a newscaster, you're reading this and go, oh, wow, look at this. The, vaccine, the unvaccinated benefited from the vaccinated. Then you go back and look at this data, as we see, draw your own conclusions. Again, now my inflection in my voice is unfair, but still just the same. I'm, I'm just amazed. Here we go. Uh, this is interesting too. Now here we go. This is like the whole thing is like all on vaccines because again, the the harder the push, obviously, the more likely ah, Adobe Cloud. The harder the push, the more likely you're going to get pushed back. And with the making vaccines, this COVID-19, they're making an experimental vaccine override your biological right to self-determination based upon uh, something which they consider a pandemic, which at one time it was very serious and had potential to be very bad. Um, but things have changed, but they're still thinking old school and they're getting away with it. So I want them to be questioned. Doesn't mean they're not right, but you know what? The basically the level of justification needs to be a little higher than just, I told you so. In this state of emergency, seriously, still, <laughs> that, that, 
that needs to change. So let's review as follows. Next one. Researchers estimate COVID-19 positive rate in stock. That's pollution bias. Again, it's 115 in the AM and I'm rambling, but still just the same. Researchers estimate COVID-19 positive rate in Stockholm during the first year of pandemic. Look at this. For the study, research examined blood from 2,600 blood donors, blah, blah, blah. We read through it, da, 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 19% of the study group at the end of February 2021, shortly before mass vaccinations entered the adult population. Remember, everyone hated Sweden. They said, you know, this and that, everything else like that, they're going to end the world and they're going to cause infections left and right. All right, well, so on and so forth. Nearly 96% of positive samples screened displayed virus neutralizing responses comparable to those provoked by the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Suggests that milder infection generally provide a degree of protection upon re-exposure to the virus that causes COVID-19. Bingo. That's exactly what we covered the week prior. Remember when it said, basically, it's better to be exposed to the virus and the viral loads are low and then be re-exposed later on. So generally, it is almost the same as a inoculating yourself against the virus like a vaccine, except through a natural environmental way. You know, it's it's just, it's the, the chronic low level exposure to build the immunity uh, in a perfect setting sounds ideal. Uh, but however, though, again, they're recommending it's comparable to the vaccines. But again, that's important. That's part of the reason why Sweden may not have endured uh, to the same level as prior. But to proceed as follows. Again, interesting. Now we all know Asia. Asia is obviously where the SARS-CoV-2 began to really spread. But, you know, you're looking at uh, countries like Japan and Taiwan and so on and so forth. A lot of our Asian friends really, I mean, it's like, what's the mortality rate from COVID in Taiwan? Look it up and you'll understand exactly what I mean. Or Singapore or, of course, Japan. Now researchers are discovering there may be a genetic reason for that. And I'm only going to read the first aspect of the Japanese study. Approximately 60% of Japanese individuals carry an LL, which in combination with the previous CCOV, cold coronavirus, infections might help explain the surprisingly low prevalence of COVID-19 in Japan. So they have a, a genetic defense already built in uh, that has given them a propensity to not be fall, to uh, not have a severely negative outcome in reference to SARS-CoV-2 developing COVID-19 and so on and so forth. So it's it's intriguing when you look at uh, how to describe a SARS-CoV-2 as far as natural immune responses. So to think about this, if you're in the United States and you have this LL, then generally, ironically, at least in reference to the COVID-19, there is an advantage if the information here is validated in other studies. But it is food for thought. So a lot of people of Asian descent, even though it's really weird because, you know, initially we saw it as uh, harming the Asian community more so, but at least in the Japanese data here, um, you know, looking at the four common cold coronaviruses, in combination with this, this may be some promise, but it's still the information has to be researched as follows. Again, HIV, remember HIV? Uh, smallpox uh, exposure and bubonic plague uh, yielded two gene LLs, which gave a natural defense against HIV. It was something which was looked at a long, long time ago, and I think it still holds today. But to proceed as follows. This is important. This is the information which uh, I regret has the connections have not been made in a venue, which is more important than my YouTube channel. This has to be really incorporated into a hospital setting and you're gonna see where it all comes together as follows. All right, efforts to treat COVID-19 patients chronicled in UC health medications data. You'll see exactly where I'm going with this. We tend to put hospitalized patients in general on anticoag anticoagulant to reduce the risk of clots, which can happen because they may be lying in place or mobile for long stretches. Something to think about. Well, is COVID-19 causing the blood clots or is it because the people that have COVID-19 tend to be in long-term care facilities and are mobile longer? But then we started to notice uh, thrombophilia in COVID-19 patients. So in exoparin, 
Am I pronouncing that appropriately? And heparin. Both became very important, not just for prophylaxis, but as treat treatments. And please forgive me, I've mispronounced that. Heparin. Focus on heparin. You ready? So we look at this. This is how heparin is being distributed through hospitals. Now, I know a lot of medical professionals, alarm bells already went off. So look how often heparin is used there because it became a, a primary standard of care. Now, keep in mind, there were interesting benefits in reference to heparin that we covered in helping mitigate the likelihood of succumbing to COVID-19 until we basically incorporate the vaccine. Now, Keep this scenario in your head. An individual is in the hospital. They're immobile. They'll be given heparin as an anticoagulant. And as they're given heparin as an anticoagulant, they're vaccinated. Now we go to the next articles and you'll see where we're going with this. COVID-19 vaccination thrombosis can be prevented by prompt treatment. All right, it happens quite a bit. So what they're looking at as follows because the mortality rate is high. Uh, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count. What do they say? The usual heparin preparations must not be used to prevent clotting since they can trigger thrombosis or aggravate it. What's prescribed commonly? Let's back it up here. And for example, you see basically da -da -da, what we're we looking at, heparin. Where did it even go? But yeah, heparin became very important, not just prophylactic, but as a treatment. Remember the Spanish flu? Uh, one thing they did not tell you a lot about is the fact is at that time, aspirin be, uh, lost its patent, I believe. So generally, aspirin became a primary protocol for treating the Spanish flu. You know how much they used to dosage people with aspirin during the Spanish flu? I'll leave that up to you to research. You'd be quite surprised. Uh, but here we go with heparin. So if heparin is the primary, one of the primary medical protocols for individuals which are immobile uh, to prevent blood clots, obviously, because they're on a ventilator, whatever it is, and then they get vaccinated. Let's, let's basically confirm that information. Once again, guidance on treatment of rare blood clots and low platelets related to COVID-19 vaccine. Risk of CVST blood clots eight to 10 hot times higher following a COVID-19 infection as compared to risk of associated with COVID-19 vaccine, special report, that da, 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 da. American Heart Association. What do they say? All patients with suspected CVST due to a COVID-19 vaccine should be treated with non-heparin anticoagulants, such as da, 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 da. No heparin products in any dose should be given. So medical policy, to play it safe. What they should do is do a washout period with heparin if they're going to vaccinate them or during the length of time being vaccinated and move to a different anticoagulant and stay away from heparin. So you can have this situation here where you're having a high mortality rate post-vaccination and it'd be a very, very simple, very simple and caring thing to do. Just connect the dots, vaccines, blood clotting, no heparin, heparin being prescribed commonly. Again, that is something for you to review as you see fit. And medical professionals, please, what a simple, simple mitigation tactic to ensure in the survival of individuals that may be in a hospital. Uh, at the same time, not succumbing to becoming one more adverse event report due to a COVID-19 vaccine. All right, so let's begin with the research and the data as follows. Here we go. Back to do, 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 da, da, right there. All right. Data frames. What we're doing is we're dealing with the various data, data system. We are pulling from, again, as I showed for, well, I want to go back to that in a second, right here. All right. I'm going to leave this one up because that's going to be important. So as we go through, all right, our data. We're going to make sure our data frames and you have duplicates. Now, the duplicates is important because what's going to happen is if you go backwards in basically pulling your data uh, and you go the wrong way, you're going to overestimate uh, the vaccine adverse reports by far. So you got to make sure duplicates are removed. And for the general layman in the population, you're going to see something really interesting. All right, so here are our value counts. 
So you see this value count of 100 to 1, uh, 101, 9, 6, 7, 0. 20. What that means is this. See right here? The person, unfortunately, and again, this was a fatality, had so symptom 1, symptom 2, symptom 3, symptom 4, symptom 5 had so many symptoms and the medical community here or the medical uh, the whoever was there did everything everything uh, i mean i mean horrible things uh that it started to occur but you, they did everything they possibly could to help this one individual but so what's happened is they ran out of room to basically put all the symptoms down in the vaccine adverse event reporting so keep in mind 101.9670 and for validation, just to show you the same chart. Here is the here is the detailed medical data on this poor individual, male, 55, from Washington. Uh, yeah, that was the outcome. All right. So, and anybody tells you that there's no, I mean, I heard it, even on the major news channels that there's no no uh, mortality figures in reference to VARES, maybe not confirmed. But however, though. They're 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 gravely mistaken and a high amount of prejudice in their basically their verbal uh, analysis of the vaccines. So here's the symptoms. Some of these are testing. The person died after the second test. I don't know why they, they gave him a second vaccine, but yeah. So that's the adverse event reporting uh, in reference to that one individual. So what we did here in the data frame is we only took the first report so we can get an accurate number of reports based to give us an accurate number of vaccine adverse event reports as opposed to the duplication which can appear as 20 separate reports but it's actually one report that had to fill 20 pages that's the way to look at it all right so here we go data frames data frames we brought it all down symptom text we reviewed that last week these are all the categories we're looking at here's a vaccine report these are all the other vaccines out there, boom, 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 and so on and so forth. So yeah, so most of our vaccine adverse reports, this is this is unprecedented and historical. This is the first time in history this has ever occurred. And they're gonna, they're gonna pace passports and work employment and everything else based upon experimental vaccines, which are coming in with vaccine adverse reports, which is flooding the system. Yeah, that's a high, heavily misguided uh, pandemic mitigation policy. All right, here we go. Boom, 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 down the line. This is COVID, 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 COVID vaccine reaction reports by age. All right, there is that 16-year-old group that you want to do. I don't know how you get 10 to 15. I don't know if that's data mistakes or what, but that's unusual, and you got some lower ones than that. But however, though, seriously – in a group which has a very, very low uh, negative outcome rate, it's mostly asymptomatic. Another one to stop transmission, but until you can prove that COVID-19 uh, vaccines prevent transmission, and I'm looking at that uh, nursing home data, good luck. All right, here we go. Boom, 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 35 to 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 70. Look, now, look, here's the interesting aspect too. You have a vaccine reaction by age. You have almost the same number of people between the age of 35 and 40 uh, having adverse reactions as opposed to 65 and 70. And that's the number, 17,500. That's accumulated so far. Vaccine death reports by age. Now keep in mind, if they're being in a hospital and then, for example, they're being in heparin and there's no anticoagulant and they get a vaccine, yeah, that's going to raise up mortality risk by far. Here's your ages all the way down the line. That's got to suck. Because right here, you make it all the way through life and so on and so forth, and you're over 100 years of age, and the vaccine takes you out. Yeah, I'm not. That's no, no cool. Now this is interesting too. All right, this requires validation. Again, various reports need to be cleaned, so think of it as raw data. Uh, but I'm seeing here and here. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, typos or inputs. But that's that's. I don't see any dot right there by age is odd. So as we go here, 16, 15, 17, 18, uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is numerical 120. So yeah, still, there is the vaccine death reports by age. Uh, probably the, the highest here is about 75. So we continue down the line. 
Uh, this thing right here is basically a rolling seven, which I'll show you in a second how that works. This is the vaccine reports. The median here, I should put that as a, you're averaging 1,612 reports per day. All right, that's the mean all the way through here. Now, what we have here is vaccine reports by day. So vaccine adverse event reports. And again, most all of them are the COVID-19 vaccines. So I, we have, I mean, honestly, between you and I and our research community, uh, we have, if you watch public news, it really sucks. I mean, it really, really is really bad. I don't care if it's what network it is. They really, really are bad at, at, uh, at reporting. So COVID vaccine reactors, the only, the only reports they're doing is what's being fed to them. And most of the reports that are given are designed to polarize us to make us hate each other. Overall, though, uh, this data has to be looked at because there needs to be improvements in the vaccine event reporting system or vaccines. I mean, this is not my conjecture on this is publisher bias, but the data is not selection bias. The data is from the CDC directly. All right, what we're doing right here is this are rolling seven. So you, about, on average, looking about 17,500 reports per week, you know, on some weeks, some weeks less, and then it goes up and down. Of course, demand for the vaccine has been going down and that's why the weird incentives like cake, candy, donuts, and French fries, probably not the best thing you want to take with the vaccine, but still just the same. Uh, as the demand goes down, so have, has that also declined. All right, now we're looking at, I basically look at the data frames. I'm going to end up doing some cool pair plots uh, next week because I'm going to try to figure out which vaccines are, re are related to which symptoms. You look at the top 20 symptoms. Again, when this is 4K, it'd be a little clearer. Uh, you see right there, those are uh, symptoms, for example, anxiety, uh, body temperature increase, obviously temperature. COVID-19 is a symptom from the COVID-19 vaccine. I didn't write it. That's how it's reported. So if people say that you can't get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Chances are it's a correlation. But however, though, it's being reported as a symptom. You guys speak to your medical practitioners about reporting. I'm just reading the data. And if you say that's incorrect, don't talk to me. Talk to your medical professionals, all right? Because all I'm doing is just reading the CDC data directly. Now, just out of curiosity, the number of people that had five or more symptoms, 82,060. So remember uh, that one patient we looked at, 20 reports to fill up all the side effects and testing they had to do? 82,060 people had at least five symptoms, all right? So they filled up the entire page. So something to think about. All right, and then of course, how do we compare so far to all of 2020? Reported vaccine reactions all of 2020 versus up to May 14, 2021. Remember last week we were at 182,000. Now we're up here. Now they could have dumped some data on reference to it, but that's all we have to look at. And I'll follow this up later on because it's 48 minutes and let's cover the global data. All right, let's go back to this. This is still pretty disturbing. All right, state data. There we go. Da, da, da. Are we down at the bottom here? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to cover all of it. Uh, generally, this is the areas which had uh, stopped the mask. All right, here we are. Remaining states with mask mandates or mask until medical state compliance orders are obeyed. These are the remaining states. So now these states become our controls. So we're going to compare how these states with basically strict pandemic mitigation measures, how they compare to states without vaccine mandates, without mask mandates, without crowd or birthday party limits and so on and so forth. And now there could be some confounding involved, but I'll tell you quite honestly, these states for whatever reason could be psychological too. They could be more COVID-19 engaged, so therefore more likely to have an overdiagnosis. Or people in these states could be less COVID-19 engaged. They feel sick, so they don't go to the doctor to get diagnosed. So you see what I mean? Uh, but however, though, I'm not seeing any any benefit one way or the other. Remember Vermont was the breakout area? And that was the neighboring states. Let's look at, um, I'm going to move kind of fast here. There's Michigan. Michigan still has got their mask mandate. States around it. 
Wisconsin, nah, nothing. And then we go down here to do for speed, Minnesota. States around that remember none of them had any mask mandates or anything like that. Da da da. All right, and keep in mind too, for the reporters out there that said that California is going to lift its mask mandate after January 15th, let me show you the email that I received from the Santa Barbara County of Health Department. All right, this is where we're going to take a little bit of a, of a side trip. May 21st, 2021. This is addressed to me. It says after June 15th, according to da 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 da, da, da all sectors and listen to blueprint activities, business tiers, so on and so forth, and certain news channel F with ends with an X was totally wrong because they didn't read the email. They said, oh, California's going to lift its mask mandate after, after June 15th. Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. Because, quote, in bold, it is important to note that employers are still subject to the current Cal OSHA, da, 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 which includes requirements for masking and social distancing. It will review the rec- recommendations on June 3rd. No F blank X news. They are not lifting the mandate. It was no one said they were lifting the mask mandate in California. Do a little bit better research. And however, though, here we are. Vaccine verification, negative testing, still restrictions. Then we're gonna, I, No one's lifting their state of emergency. That's like, what the freaking heck? And nothing that they've done has shown any benefit of working, but still, state of emergency, still? Yeah, uh, that's that's a little maniacal. A little bit of Munchausen disorder there, uh, Governor. But to proceed as follows, the other data. Here we go. Bum, 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 bum. Oops, look there, wrong one. All right, so here we are. So we go there, and I don't think there's any more information as of use. Uh, COVID to hospitalizations, you notice the drops there, drop there. Everything's getting better. Uh, the states with uh, loose states, the green states, still outperforming by far, the tight states, by far. Um, oil of data there, data. Not running into a lot of states left with strong uh, mask mandates. But it seems to be a drop in the incidence. Doesn't mean it can't go up, but that's the beauty about weaponizing uncertainty. Why not it be influenza? Why not be uh, strep? Why not be whooping cough? What's the next pandemic? Uh, and so and so on and so forth. And so nothing really uh, data-wise, even here as far as um, new deaths. There's again I, with controls now. White are the, the few 13 remaining states which are uh, maintaining their mask mandates. But I want to go to world data real fast. We're gonna have to probably wrap it up because it is getting pretty late. Let's check real fast here. That's your vaccine distributions between the uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen, Johnson and Johnson. All right, hospital occupancy, COVID patients. Well, we could do that already. There's the curve's been flat for a long, long time. Florida, remember Florida's supposed to fall off the edge of the earth? New York. Da, da, da. All right, that's being repetitive. Uh, da, da. Uh, all of a sudden, let's go to here, here real fast. I want to do the world data because it's important. Here's the mortality cases in Europe. Uh, you still in a state of emergency, Europe? Or are they still keeping threatening to lock everyone down? Here's your mortality per million. And looking pretty much like the, like the scientists had predicted in the beginning, uh, becoming pretty superfluous compared to the flow. Not in the beginning, no. Now, mm, yeah. Look at this. Check this out. All right, here goes. Do, 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 do. I want to get to data. It's easier to see. Look at that drop all of a sudden. I, I regret it. It wasn't a few more days to, to validate that. That looks like a pretty precipitous drop. But look what's happening here. Asia. This is the uh, new cases overall on the shared y-axis. So this is a good comparison. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Asia began to drop dramatically in cases overall. Dramatically. So that is just, I mean, out of nowhere, just plummet. And so here we go as far as that. Let's see if they have a, a better graph here. Let's look at the world. All right. And there's Asia again. All right, because well, Asia, part, India is part of that group, so keep that in mind. So that's where the drop is coming precipitously. All right, there we are. There we are. I'm going to go up to the world as a whole. So again, don't get too dizzy. Here we go. Da, da, da. Let's look at a cooler graph. Here's the United States versus all of Asia. And again, uh, one mortality for every 7,000 individuals of all of Asia. 
uh, one mortality for every 557 people in the United States. Could it be genetics? Again, it's something that a researcher going to have to explore. Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. There's our drop in the United States. If you want to look at cases per million. Uh, cases per million. And then all of a sudden, there's a mortality percentage. Here it is. New cases smooth per million. This is global. This is across the entire world. We're getting this information from uh, Oxford University, our world in data. Uh, look, all of a sudden, boom. That drop. All of a sudden, it just, it just drops. It collapses. There's a really interesting research article that say pandemics just collapsed. That doesn't mean it's not going to go back up, but it just collapsed. And that's uh, mortality percentage of positive cases, pretty much steady. But there's that, that curve. It just goes up and then down, and then it collapses. All right, let's look at information real fast. Again, I'm going to move in real fast because I want to go 60 minutes. Uh, let's look at our Monte Carlo. There's our Monte Carlo, new predictions on the Monte Carlo model. If we continue to follow this path, uh, we're pretty much by, I guess, what is that? October 11th, we're going to be somewhere in this range at the worst case scenario, below one case per million. At the best case scenario, about 0.2 cases per million. And right now, we're basing upon all of our prior data up to May 23rd prior. And the model that I made here, obviously, for those that are familiar, is based upon stock predictions. All right, let's see real fast. Uh, right here. Uh, this is our world data. And Italy going down at about 2.5. And keep in mind, India has a mortality rate higher than, uh, less than Italy, but yet it's perceived totally different uh, by global news sources. So please forgive me, but I'm going to end it a little short before we get to cover all the data as we see um, uh, that are out there. There's India. It's still see about 2.5. And then we look at you know, other, other places, of course. France, 2.5. France and India have about the exact same mortality rate. But yet, you don't hear much about France in the news, but you do see a lot of pictures coming from India. All right, so let's go back to the, our data as follows what we covered. So first off, we are looking at the vaccine, uh, the Vera system, and that pretty much sums it all up. Uh, and I'll break up the data a little bit more in detail next week. Uh, we looked at basically do, 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 our vaccine reaction reports. We looked at guidance and treatment, heparin and vaccine uh, induced clots, not ideal. Uh, uh, be very, very humane and nice thing to do if they don't prescribe heparin uh, when individuals get a vaccine in the hospital or vaccinated in a hospital because it would just be kind. Uh, genetics, Japanese may have a very, very built in defense against uh, COVID 19. That's henceforth the uh, lack of um, uh, negative outcomes in Japan. Uh, Many people already in Stockholm, uh, in Sweden, already had 96% of the samples were positive and they already had neutralized bodies compared to the vaccine. So why get vaccinated? I don't know. Uh, incidents of SARS and uh, nursing homes, we went through that. And the nursing homes, um, numerically, without making any conjecture, the individuals which are unvaccinated, you could say they benefited from the vaccinated or not. But however, though, in most cases, they seem to outperform the vaccinated to give us an idea of uh, what's happened. And then generally, vaccine production, why uh, it may be questionable in reference to making vaccines mandated uh, upon emergency approval when there are so many potential outcomes which would be negative long term, which have not been delved into. Again, gratitude. Thank you. Ooh, 58 minutes, one of our longest ones. Humbly and gratitude most often to the researchers who publish the research bravely in an environment in which groupthink is basically not just um, rewarded, uh, you know, verbally, but also financially. But regardless of that, gratitude to those brave researchers, gratitude to those uh, hospital technicians, gratitude to all of them. Thank you for all the data. And I'll catch you all once again next week. We're all signing off. Bye.